be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The basis for today's sermon is the gospel lesson that we just heard, that being the feeding of the 4,000. So let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. My father has a very unique way of eating an orange. He gets out his pocket knife because real men carry pocket knives. Please don't tell him I opt for carrying fingernail clippers. But with his knife in hand, he takes the orange and he cuts a hole in the top. And then he begins to slurp out the juice. He squeezes the orange and then slurps again, and he repeats that exact same process until the juice is gone. And then what he does is he sticks his thumb in the, or thumbs in the hole that he made, and he opens it up, and he tastes, and he sees that the orange is good. That is similar to our gospel lesson, in that there is a lot here to squeeze out of. With the text already having been read for us, it's like the hole has already been cut in the top. And upon our first squeeze, as it were, we see the care and the compassion that Christ has for those who leave things behind in order to focus upon hearing him. And what do I mean by that? Well, this miracle has been done before. That is the feeding of the 5,000. Yet that feeding was for folks who were merely curious. They were interested more in Jesus' healings They were interested in seeing what miracles Jesus would do. Essentially, they just came out to enjoy the show. They only spent a day with Jesus, not far from their cities, not far from their homes. And after eating, most of them, my guess is, didn't stick around very long. This crowd, though, it's different. They left things behind. They journeyed into the wilderness and were with Jesus three days for no other reason than to hear him, to learn from him, to receive eternal life from him. Think of Martha and Mary. You know that story. Martha, who's so terribly busy, and then, of course, Mary concentrating on Jesus. The group here, beloved, is like Mary. They are not like Martha. They are like Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, not even realizing that they've run out of food. They won't be able to make it back home without collapsing, and it's as if they're not even bothered by that. The nature of God is... It's a word, actually, that has to do with your guts, your innards. I remember when my children were small, I'm sure you had the exact same feeling, or the same sensation come upon you. I would look in, especially with my, oh, I think I had it with all four, uh, as I recall, but I remember at least with the first one having this intense sensation right in my gut. I would I had been with this child all day long. And now she's finally clean, and she's in her jammies, and she's in her bed, and she's fast asleep. And of course, as any parent would, you open up the door, and you see them there, and you feel it right there. It's in your gut. Then they became teenagers. (laughs) Never happened anymore. Jesus had compassion as seeing the people as sheep without a shepherd. He says, I have compassion on the multitude. He says as well, because they've continued with me. Think back to Mary. They have continued with me for three days and have nothing to eat. As a result, everything turns out fine for those who stay with Jesus, for they trust him to take care of them. 
and he does. He has the people sit down and wait. Now think about that. Us Lutherans, we've got a lock on this. They're passive. They just open empty hands and what? Receive. It's a lovely picture of the gospel. We do nothing, nothing but receive. And Jesus is the one who does all the work. Well, the compassion of Jesus did not end there. Jesus' compa Jesus's compassion, of course, took him all the way to the cross where he died, not only for the people that he fed that day, but for all of you as well. It falls under the umbrella of his nature, that being what? Compassion. It is the nature of our God. Well, that's a good squeeze. But there's another squeeze. Another squeeze of the gospel. Jesus was not joking when he said that we do not live by bread alone. We need bread. But more importantly, we need a steady diet of God's word. Now look, reading the Bible on your own is no easy undertaking. This is why the church has referred the beginner in the Christian faith to the preached word, where the word is explained and it's expanded upon. The preached word is easier to assimilate than the word that is read on the page. They both have cons and they both have benefits. However, most of you are not beginners in the faith, which is why my exhortation, very briefly, this morning is to encourage you to read your Bible. Man does not live by bread alone. In order to do that, you've got to have a plan. You've got to determine a place and a time and stick to it. Reading a Bible in the year, man, that's a fine task if you're into that sort of thing. My experience is it's just not possible for most folks. Most of us need longer. We read something, and even though we're supposed to finish the next three chapters, we get caught on something, and that leads us over here, and that leads us over here, and this leads us over here, and all of a sudden you're like, man, time flew. I've got to make up for lost time tomorrow. Well, tomorrow might come, and tomorrow might be the exact same. The goal of our reading the Bible is not to get through the Bible. Of course, the goal of reading our Bible is for the Bible to penetrate us and to get through us. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So that's another squeeze there in our gospel text, but there's another one. With our last squeeze, we recall how Jesus does miraculous things with food and drink. You recall back in the Exodus wanderings, God fed those making their way to the promised land with manna. Manna simply means, what's this? Somebody held it up and said, what's this? Manna. But it wasn't just manna. It was also water from a rock. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, Paul says, that rock followed them. That rock followed them, and that rock was Christ, is what he said. So God fed them with manna and water from a rock. And now this one who can make seven loaves, feed thousands, can and is present with his body. And the wine and the bread, because this God does miraculous things with food and drink. This miraculous provision for the body ultimately points to the miraculous provision for the soul, namely the Lord's Supper, the sacrament of the altar, the Eucharist, communion. Jesus gives it to us for the same reason that he gave them food that day. He fed them that day because he knew without his help they would perish, and he gives us his supper for the exact same reason. Without him we perish. He knows we're dying. Without his help, without the forgiveness of sins, without life and salvation that only he offers, we too would perish, but perish eternally. 
All right. So following my father's orange-eating method, after all the squeezing and the slurping up that we can get from this gospel text, what is left for us to do? It's to eat. It's to taste and to see that the Lord Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise for prayer.